Hello strategy gaming enthusiasts, my name is Alsbo HD, and in today's video, we are going to explore some of the most interesting one province nations in EU4. These OPMs are packed with flavor despite their minor initial potential, and in this video, we're going to unlock their abilities, uncover their historical flavor, and discover their achievements. But before we get started, this video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive, the developers of EU4. This weekend, EU4 and other PDX titles are on sale, so make sure you check out the Paradox Strategy Weekend Sale, which is available in the description box below. Avar away in the dormant Caucasus lies the Avar Khanate, a one-province Sunni state. This purported progenitor of the Avarian Pannonian Khaganate starts their campaign as a vassal of Gazimuk, with whom they dispute the Duchy of Dagestan. Subjectively speaking, they have one of the coolest flags in-game, and if you're hungry like the wolf, you can paint Caucasia in Cyan. Like their Chechen and Circassian neighbors, Avaria boasts Caucasian national ideas, which grant increased national manpower, mercenary modifiers, and yearly boosts to their prestige, legitimacy, and army tradition. But Magyar, you're hungry, in which case you can eat Hungary and obtain the Avar Cognate achievement in Iron Man mode. While it takes two to tango, it takes a pro to master Tuang Go. This Burmese dynasty rose from OPM obscurity to dominate Southeast Asia, and their end-game potential to regain their domain is insane. These Burmese barons boast exceptionally powerful national ideas, including a plus 25% to national manpower, plus 20% to religious unity, negative 2 to global unrest, and a substantial negative 15% core creation cost to impose bird law on all of Myanmar. Once they expand, their mission tree offers claims on all of peninsular Southeast Asia and large portions of China, and offer permanent bonuses to governing capacity, missionary strength, and yearly legitimacy. Burma is best in class, and their lands are predominantly grass and farmlands, which allows you to development push early on and embrace institutions. You can also upgrade the Palace of Pegu for a global negative 20% to advisor costs, plus 2 to diplomatic relations, and a plus 1 to diplomatic reputation, while the Burmese Bagon temples offer plus 2 missionaries and a massive plus 2% to missionary strength. With these bonuses, you can get your Rangon, their ancestral lands, and, if you're in Iron Man mode, can obtain the first Tuangu Empire achievement by conquering the 20 remaining Burmese culture territories in 56 years. It's time to say hello to Hiawatha and journey to Onondaga, one of the five OPM nations of the Iroquois Federation. This league of peaceful pre-Columbian Americans is headed by the Onondaga tribe, which grants you an initial advantage of plus 10% army morale and plus 1 diplomatic reputation. These proud people of the Long House offer northeastern indigenous ideas, which place an emphasis on shipbuilding, state building, and diplomacy. But you can also take a pass on the peace pipe and opt for war, as Onondaga and the Five Nations can form the Iroquois Formable Nation by passing through Tribal Federation reforms. This Formable Federation boasts increased combat ability and diplomatic reputation, national manpower bonuses, and a rare plus 5% discipline on the North American continent. And speaking of America, Onondaga and the Five Nation OPMs have incredible missions that grant them claims across the known world, and, with an extra colonist, the power to stake their own free real estate. Iron Man players able to secure a Six Nation army can further obtain the Six Nations achievement by forming a federation, which is easy, given you'll only need to invite two tribes on day one. While there are ostensibly a thousand nations of the Persian Empire, Ardabil, at number 7, is an OPM whose ambitions are anything but minor. Their ambitions and ideas place a premium on Persian rugs, and grant increased national manpower, army morale, and a whole lot more. This Shiite state is subject to the Safavid dynasty, who in real life went on to form Persia. But in Europe Universalis, you can also use them to form the mighty Mughal Empire. But in my campaign, I ran the normal way around, and when you form Persia, you get claims across the Middle East, Central Asia, and beyond, 
and far better ideas that grant much needed army morale and discipline. And speaking of discipline, if you convert to Zoroastrianism, the supremely powerful Baku Ateshka of neighboring Azerbaijan provides Persia a whopping plus 10% army discipline, along with cultural conversion reductions and other bonuses. Players pursuing Persia as Ardabil can secure the Shahanshah and the This is Persia achievement by forming Persia and owning all of the Anatolian, Egyptian, and Hellenic regions. OG Ayatollahs can also obtain the Keep the Flame Burning achievement by reverting to Zarathustra and controlling their five historical holy sites. But perhaps you prefer your OPMs high, dry, and monarchy free. In this case, you should check out the three stateless societies of Raid, Koho, and Jirai in the Zomia Highlands. These anarchic, autonomous areas all possess the stateless society government form, making them unique and granting them plus 15% to army morale and plus 75% to fort defense. There is of course the negative 99% modifier to governing capacity, which is minor, and only prevents you from expanding beyond your starting state unless if you enjoy plus 9000% advisor, stability, and core creation costs. You could of course reform out of anarchy, but why would you? And starting as a tribal tag without feudalism is not for the faint of start. These three OPMs also belong to the Malay culture group, which means you could form Anarchist Malaya. But if you're a true raid, South Asian legend, you could obtain the Rags and Riches achievement by plundering your neighboring nations and redistributing their capital for the proletarian revolution. And speaking of revolution, you might want to check out my raid campaign, where we absorbed almost all of East Asia in anarchy. But before we continue, the YouTube algorithm has informed me that you have a 3 in 4 chance of not being subscribed. If you like this video, be sure to send out a diplomat and besiege the subscription box. Now that we're allied, it's time to continue the video. So we've made it past the midpoint of today's video, and our next OPM is a potential pirate daimyo you never knew you needed. This is because of a unique event that can fire after any Shinto state encounters pirates, which could happen as soon as the first in-game month. With so many daimyo duking it out in the Sengoku Jedi, it might teleport behind you, in which case you can embrace it or keep the pirates at bay. You are a pirate, so you have access to the Raid Coast mechanic, which allows you to pillage and plunder coastlines for bountiful booty. And, as a pirate, so also has unique missions which you can then double dip upon uniting Japan under Yar protection. This means you effectively have two mission trees, and, like other Nipponese nations, gives you free claims across all of Korea, Manchuria, Taiwan, Oceania, and subjugation Casas Bellies on Southeast Asia. Penitent pirates set on accumulating achievements can obtain so many as this Tsushima tag, Given that they convert to Christianity, unite all of Japan, embrace the Industrial Revolution, and close the state under Sokoku law. But some pirates walk the path of prophets, and the Knights of Rhodes at number 4 on our list could be considered as Catholic Corsair Crusaders. This one province island nation off of the coast of Ottoman Anatolia is in a precarious position and has 99 problems, but a boat ain't one. Unlike so, the knights bring salvation to heretical coastlines and forcibly take indulgences in the form of sailors and fiat currency. They're not pirates, they're a monastic order, it's just that the Pope has blessed them with plus 5% starting discipline and the ability to raid in 1444. With their Occitan culture, they can form France, but better fromage can be found in the other choice of Jerusalem. The Knights, along with all other Crusader states, benefits from a mission tree that grants claims across Anatolia, Africa, and even Greece. This also includes permanent modifiers that grant reduced missionary maintenance costs, increased yearly papal influence, increased naval morale, increased ship trade power, and even augments the average lifespan of your rulers by plus 
If you're not going to say ni to these knights of the round table, you can obtain two achievements after conquering Constantinople, Jerusalem, and Antioch, and going on to form the Kingdom of God. Spicing our way up the list of most interesting island OPMs are Tador and Ternati, two Malukan cultured countries in the Spice Islands. These hidden tags are mortal enemies, and once one eliminates the other, can obtain the Spice Must Flow repeatable mission event, which allows them to colonize surrounding islands without needing colonial ideas. And speaking of ideas, the Spice Islands are loaded, and feature increased goods and production efficiencies, an extra merchant, an extra diplomat, and a sizable plus 20 colonist increase to augment their spicy settler sentiments. Once your missions grant you your free event colonies, you can then unlock the ability to gain a permanent plus one colonist and negative 50% native uprising modifier, which pairs excellently with the native trading policy to grant you a 0% chance of native uprising and 50% more native assimilations. Being able to colonize so close to colonial Arrakis is a huge dune in the 1400s, and with other mission claims, allows these spicy states to declare war across all of Malaya, eventually forming the nation if so desired. If you follow this spicy strategy, you can gain this Spice Must Flow achievement in Iron Man mode, and further grab the Turn the Table achievement after Kangaroo Country is Gakolonizard. Trading their way to the top of our list is Ragusa, the Dalmatian-cultured trading nation. These ancestors of Illyria start in the heart of one of Europe's most lucrative trade nodes, and are guaranteed by the Ottoman Empire, making them invincible to any would-be Italian invader. Ragusa's maritime missions are massive and grant claims over the Balkans, negative five years of separatism to all conquered provinces, extra free centers of trade across Croatia, a permanent 5% dev cost modifier reduction, and free development in your home provinces. Their national ideas focus on generating buckets of trade ducats, but dedicated doges can use this unique nation to further form Croatia. Italy, and the new formable state of Dalmatia. The first two nations are incredibly powerful, particularly since Ragusa's Dalmatian culture is Latin, and thus you won't face penalties when expanding into Italy. And speaking of Dalmatia, this new formable of interesting Illyrians possesses fantastic military ideas that grant increased army and naval morale, increased trade power, reduced development cost, increased infantry combat ability, and a substantial negative 15% to core cost creation. If you're looking to zagreb some achievements, Iron Man Illyrians can obtain the With a Little Help achievement by leading a trade league of at least five nations and guaranteeing the Ottomans' independence. But the Basque in class, most interesting one province nation is undoubtedly Navarra, at number one on our list. This precarious polity is pinchost between Castile, Aragon, England, and potentially France at game start, making it a difficult campaign. But despite their pain in Spain, there's a lot to gain, like Navarra's starting Trastamara dynasty, which it shares with Castile and Aragon. This family tree can be used to gain personal unions over some of the strongest states in 1444, and Navarre's events grant it another personal union CB on Aragon. And speaking of personal unions, Basque missions are some of the best in game, granting claims across the North Atlantic, Iberia, France, and even the ability to enforce a PU on Paris. This Basque barony has all the naval national ideas you'd expect from an Iberian power, but also gets plus 20 yearly colonists, which pairs well with its colonial missions that grant claims across North America. If you're looking for a bold Basque task, Iron Man players can further obtain the Basque and Glory achievement by conquering and culturally converting 32 provinces in Iberia before the Age of Absolutism, or about 1610 AD. Euskara is one of my favorite nations in game, and if you'd like a guide on how to play them, you should check the card at the top right of your screen. Before ending the video, I'd like to name some of the most notable one-province nations that didn't quite make the list. 
The northern Germanic tags of Lübeck, Hamburg, and Dithmarschen are all incredibly good choices for those looking to get their hands uh, on powerful polities, but they've already appeared in our previous list of most powerful one province miners. Higher course, this also includes Desmin, quite possibly the strongest OPM with some of the best national ideas in the entire game. Incredibly difficult OPMs like Hisenkafia and Karabakh are likely to appear in a future video, which could feature the most difficult starts in the 1444 starting date. We've already covered a list on this subject more than three years ago, but the meta has changed, and if you're interested in an updated video, let me know in the comment section below. I'd like to thank everyone for watching this far and supporting the YouTube algorithm. This video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive, and if you're looking to get EU4 and other great 4X strategy games for sale, you should check out the link in the description box below. If you'd like to show your support, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. It's free, improves Imperial relations, and helps us fabricate more claims. But if you're looking to join the Empire, consider donating to our Patreon, buying games through our Nexus store, or donating basic attention tokens to Alzebo HD through the Brave browser. As always, I greatly appreciate your support for the channel, and, without further ado, it's time to roll the credits.